Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Welcome. And Kadar King, Melissa Longo, and Heather Jordan. <laughs> They're going to be Hello. taking over the show Hi. today. They don't need us. <laughs> oh, this ladies night. <laughs> Rock, shall we uh, okay. push ourselves out then? <laughs> All right, we'll let, the, we'll let the lady take care of it. <laughs> oh, what a no. okay, I could go on. I could go on. <laughs> All right. Have a great show, guys. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Keep your Thanks. keep their ear keep their ears open. Yeah, keep them clean. Your ears open. <laughs> All right. My both right. ears, yeah. Bye guys. Good show. <laughs> All right. Well, Hello, ladies. Hey. Hello. So we are discussing um, Second Sight today. Second yes. Sight. That's right. Great episode. Yeah. You know, I I was doing my research and I was like, oh, I remember that episode. It was awesome. So um, I actually love the actress who played Fena. Agreed. Um, oh gosh. She's in Eureka. So I loved that okay. show. So seeing her on DS9, because I'm familiar with some of her other work, that was like, oh, awesome. You know? That's <laughs> right. What's her name? I want to, uh, Sally. Her Elise name Richardson, is right? Sally Elise Richardson Whitfield. That's right. Yeah. 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 She does a tremendous job in this episode and at first when the when the guys were like hey guys gonna review second slide i was like oh it's like the mushy romantical <laughs> girly episode but that's fine we can we can go there but i think she does a tremendous job she's so present great yeah yeah i was really moved by the opening um this opening scene like i i mean it, it started out so sentimental you know it they're you know Sirac, or i should say um jake is talking about you know the bad dream he had and you know there and uh commander cisco is reassuring him and there's one line that did they throw in there where you know who he's talking about but they don't specifically mention it and he's mm -hmm. like i miss her and you know and and um cisco says i miss her too mm -hmm. and it it was just you know obviously they're talking about Jake's mom and so it kind of brings you into like I think that paves the way for Cisco to have a romantic you know relationship with Fena yeah true yeah. I love like, her costumes in this uh, episode as well I think you sort of if you have a theater background or you come from the theatrical uh, design background when she walks up and you see her in this flowy it's very fantastical has that fantasy element to it and it's red so it's very yeah. passionate and it's very it's hot you know what I mean and very sexy and but as you look at the way that the it fits across it's almost like she's you know sort of in, in a cage that's how I sort of was looking at yeah. it, it sort of trapped and yeah. if, if we've all seen the episode I'm just assuming we've all seen it now um that that basically this is a whole, this is all a fantasy. Essentially, she's a projection. It turns out that she's a projection of uh, a woman who, Nadelle. who's fully married. Nadelle, right? Yes. And, uh, and what's the basic sum you know, summary of the episode is that uh, this woman appears. She's very mysterious. This guy is enamored with her. And then as time goes on, he's trying to learn more about her. But she's very cagey about who she is and where she comes from and won't tell him anything about herself. And then as we follow his investigations, um, trying to go through Odo to get more information, thinking she's in trouble, then he actually meets the real in the flesh person and thinks it's the same person. So she introduces herself as Fena. And then, you know, they've got this famous terraformer. It's Gideon Saitic, I believe, right? And he's this egomaniacal, self-admittedly, like he admits it, <laughs> he's a maniac, which I love. I love that. That's so... Um, so brilliant and you know you want to like you're annoyed by him you want to feel you could you get that sense that you feel just as anyone else does meeting this guy that he's hilarious at first he's kind of fun but because he's full so, of himself full of himself you know you wouldn't want a nice place to visit wouldn't want to wouldn't want to live with the guy so <laughs> don't blame Adele for maybe being unhappy but they don't really the thing I, I find that in the episode that they don't do a lot of exploration on is why is she really so unhappy and uh, they did touch on it and maybe it was it's a it's a 
very small line. I think it may have been where she's like passed out. Nadal is, and Fena actually they confront. Fena confronts or confronts Nadal mm. physically. Not like you know they don't have a confrontation, but she sees her. He mentions that her race mates for life or That's marries right. for life, and I guess she was homesick, um, but she couldn't go back home because of her marriage, like something about their, how their race bonds or mates. Yeah. So I think that that was the, she was unhappy because she wanted to go home, but Sayatik um, did not want to go home or to her home because he was this traveler and scientist. And ultimately, um, I don't know if I want to give away the ending just yet, but ultimately he, you know, makes a decision enabling her to return home. Right. He sort of sets her free. Yeah. Which was a great, you know, I'll save that for the end because it's, a, it's <laughs> interesting. It's noble yeah. for him, for him, his, you know, personality. It's like as altruistic as that guy could possibly be. And even we all knew it was still for his own glory in the sense, because he's mixed sure. Oh yeah. Know, yeah. You know, Make sure it's recorded in the official record. You know, like, yeah. He's like, I'll never be forgotten now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, he was also, you know, um, not trying to figure out where he would go next. Like they, this was the, the big magnum opus was, you know, really rebirthing this dead star. And so what was he going to do afterward? That was my question. And as far as the writing of the story elements are concerned in the episode was, well, it seems like he's sort of coming, he's kind of sort of slowing down because what else is he going to do after he's, you know, brought a star back from death? You know, what else is there next for him to achieve? And you could sense that he doesn't even know. And so I thought, well, maybe that'll give him an opportunity to like sort of bond with his wife or maybe that, that would be the thing that kind of sort of brings them back together. He doesn't even have to necessarily sacrifice himself to actually save his marriage. But in the sense that, you know, you don't really, he, you have to sort of, you, you want to part with this guy. <laughs> and it's like, I want to, I wanted him to sort of go away. But at the very, you know, when you talk about spoiling the end, there's just like, there's so many good moments, but I think uh, Sally is just, she is captivating. I mean, for the very moment that she speaks, and um, she's very intentional. She she gives these pauses, these these moments to breathe between her and Cisco, and to develop that attraction. And I think that is as, as very an actress, effective. She's very intelligent. She plays well. She she is clearly takes the smart roles, the in depth roles for everything that I've seen in some of the interviews that I've seen of her. So yeah. he definitely, and you know, the difference between Fana and Adele, not only is there the costuming, which is a great, like you said, Fana was flowy, red, sexy. She kind of had this like ethereal look. And then Nadal was very strict, high collar, covered. Mm-hmm. Grays you know, and silvers. Straight and- lines. They did a really great job with costuming separating Nadal and Fena and and of course Sally the actress did a great job changing the personality between the two um halves of her personality or her identity yeah what were your thoughts Melissa did, were there any some um, moments in the episode that you really thought were just amazing or what were your thoughts um i loved how how Sally, this is the only thing I've ever seen her in. And I think if, this is the moment she steps on the screen, um, she's just so striking. Um, she's stunning yeah. just to look at for one thing. So so she fits Thena in this ethereal goddess type woman. And then, um, and, and it comes across immediately. And I love the surprise of her not knowing, you know, that she is Nadell and Nadell doesn't know that she is Thena. So I loved how that played too. And the costuming as well. And I didn't realize it didn't occur to me about the caging, which is a good thought. Yeah, it's, the straps yeah. across her heart, you know, yeah. over her chest, and it sort of is this indicator that she feels trapped in some way, or that she's in prison. Right, and she certainly is a bit imprisoned. So, and then 
than being married to a man like Gideon, as he said, you know, all of his wives, previous wives had the good sense to leave him. <laughs> he didn't because of her race, you right. know, her, in her culture, they marry for life and, you know, and Gideon or Sayatek um, had the next great adventure to, to achieve and accomplish. And that's what he set for his life. And I think Adele was probably part of that great accomplishment because, you know, he did say she was very smart. He, he was like, she's, she's smart. She, she's this amazing cook. She works hard at home. Like he, he made it a point. It was also part of his bragging rights. Like mm-hmm. I have this yeah. amazing <laughs> wife, but he and describing you know, how they met and, you know, making it all about how oh, she yeah, that was terrible. That was awful. He's like, <laughs> she was infatuated with me. Well, naturally. And who <laughs> wouldn't be, you know, <laughs> and then he's like, I was surrounded by my fans. Yeah. yeah. And he said that too. He's like, but who wouldn't be right? And, yeah. It's and you want to hate him, but at the same so time, sucker. everyone's sort of still laughing and giggling because he, he is amusing. He's very entertaining. He has that energy. And you can tell, you know, he's doing good things. I mean, even everyone has to admit in the room that he's yeah. like the Federation's greatest mind. So you sort of have to give him a pass at being who he is, um, as opposed to sort of like the opposite to that, which would have been more dangerous, like uh, Malcolm McDowell's character in Generation, sort of more that, uh, not psychopathic, but more like, just darker, more darker form of that same like narcissism or uh, megalomania, but he was applying it to good things and for altruistic purposes, ultimately it came back to him, but it was a good, it's a good episode. It's um, real fun. There's a great moment at the very beginning, like Heather, you mentioned when um, he's first, Jake's first coming out and he has that calculus test tomorrow and he wakes up from this weird dream and he doesn't even want to tell his dad about it. And then finally, you know, Cisco's able to kind of coax it out. And then there's this, this beautiful moment. Sarah captures it beautifully when he stumbles and hesitates to say, I love you. Mm-hmm. You know, to say the words, I love you, dad. And it just reminds me how much I love this series as a whole. It just really, they do such a wonderful job at bringing those two characters and showing what men, men and their sons, what fathers and son relationships can be, that you can say, I love you. And that there's no shame in that or weakness in that. And I think the delivery of it is just beautiful. And Sirak is a big standing ovation for me for his. Yeah, that was um, that was great. Yeah, actually, during I did some research on this episode because I really wanted to be informed, and I found out something interesting um, from my Star Trek Deep Space Nine companion book (laughs) um, that the the original script was written for the role of the love interest for Fena to be Bashir. Oh, and um, that would have been interesting. So, and uh, I believe it was Ira said that they had been talking about really expanding more on Cisco. So they switched out Bashir because you know Bashir is like this bumbling love idiot, you know, and <laughs> so, <real> antagonist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they wanted to really define Cisco and um. And Ira is quoted as saying that they wanted to focus on the difference between Cisco and Picard. Picard is the explorer. He was, you know, in, in all of the next generation, he really never took the time to form relationships. You know, there may have been brief flings, but he never made the decision. Oh, I'm ready to have somebody. And Cisco on the other hand, is a builder he builds relationships he builds you know his time so cisco is willing to form a relationship he's already a family man he's got his son you know and and so that was one thing that ira said that they wanted to focus on on cisco being he's a a guy who's solid and real and human and that's exactly the quote that ira said in the book You know, so they really wanted to, so they used this opportunity to grow Cisco's personality, I guess his backstory, which, you know, I think really changed that episode a lot, changing it from Bashir to Cisco. Yeah, agreed. Now I couldn't even imagine. (laughs) 
No. Yeah. Her yeah, being and, infatuated. And a lot more, I think, like comedic. Like, yeah. you know, Bashir would yeah. have been seen as maybe crazy. Because yeah. there's this woman that he's suddenly, you know, seeing places but cisco as the commander he has that command to go to odo and say look for this woman for me because uh, am i going crazy you know he's he's got that command. i know he's like well what ship i don't know <laughs> yeah, that, i don't know d- let me guess you don't know <laughs> you know a little home there you know Just, yeah i love that because you see cisco is such a that young man in him you know that young man in love or infatuation and you get to see and Avery's eyes light up and all of those expressions and all that movement that he brings to it, that he sort of enlivens this, this, this infatuation that he has. And, and even Jake and, and when they're at dinner and he's you know, <laughs> asking about it and he's like, just so you know, dad, it, it, oh. you're in love. It's, it's okay with me. And dad's like, Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for supporting me. Like that's so <laughs> what I would say. I would say the same thing. He's got that snarky, um, he's always prepared, you know, for people to just like when he first when he first come in. Um, there's an, I think it's the next episode or two. He comes on to into ops, and Kira looks at him like, "What's going on?" And it's it's second oh, thought, yeah. right? Because yeah, no, it is. I him. actually took notes on that scene. So, <laughs> that scene. Yeah, it was great. Well, he comes, she comes in, and he's like, "Good morning, Major," and she's oh. like, <laughs> "Yeah, she doesn't even say good morning to him." <laughs> I know she, yo, she's done, and then he goes and orders exactly. One Charlton tea with a double twist of lemon. And when he says double twist of lemon, they cut to Kira's face <laughs> and she's like, like, what? what the heck is going on? And then she comes over and she's like, um, what's going on with you? <laughs> I always drink. I, I can't remember exactly, but it was, you know, for, I've been known you for the last year and <laughs> every day you've been coming in and well, I can't live without my, I'm not fully awake yet or something like that without my Rakugino. Yeah. And like, you ordered the tea and he's like, oh, well, I suppose I wanted something different. Is that okay with you? And I loved it when she was like, oh. Her, her response <laughs> was, <laughs> of course, you can drink whatever you like. And he's like, thank you, Major. I appreciate your support. support. I love that. <laughs> that was great. I would have written something like that. That's the kind of writing, I, that zing, you know, that he's always like making sure people understand that you understand it's okay for me to, you know, be different or have a different <laughs> taste or, you know, but it was a great, those are great moments. I just think yeah, I, I wrote down those quotes because I was like, this is great. <laughs> great interaction between Kira. And she's just kind of like, what did you just do? What did you just order? What's going on here? And then Dax coming into it and um, helping him figure out what was going on and sort it all out. And when she scans her, <laughs> she just comes right in and starts scanning her. I'd be like, what, what's going on? But um, <laughs> it's just pure energy. And I'm just like, wow, that's that's a really interesting concept. But I, th- I wonder, do we all have that? Do we all have some subconscious little, you know, projection living in our minds that we don't know about or don't? Remember, I think we've all been in, in places where we felt or we wish uh, we could be a different person or have a different life. But even well, if- there's, that brings in the astral projection. Mm-hmm. You know, that's something that people have claimed to be able to do for yeah. many years. So, you know, that that definitely falls into that that time, you know, or into that uh, myth myth of astral projection. Yeah, and there was there was a moment where Gideon had said that that this had happened like once before, and she Nadell promised it would never happen again. But it's really was, hard to you know keep all that inside and bury it permanently, especially when she clearly was like you say homesick. And and even at the end when she you know she makes that choice to go back home, there, she could have stayed. She could have. I mean, Gideon was gone. He sacrificed himself. She could have mourned and, you know, and come back to the station and pursued uh, something. But then she says, I don't remember any of that. You know, I don't, I don't have any memory, but it was part of her somehow. It was there along, you know, somewhere buried in her subconscious. So it's really interesting that they chose to let her just walk away. And of course, if she had stayed, then we wouldn't have Penny Johnson, Gerald, and we'd never have, you know, the development of that relationship. But I think it would have been really interesting to see it take, it, it run a course a little bit longer and go over uh, that arc, you know, to see it develop and maybe not work out in the end, but it was really interesting that it all sort of wraps up very neatly and it's, and it's, and then it's over and you're just kind of like, oh, 
don't go just stay <laughs> yeah oh yeah that one scene where she disappears where like literally in front of his eyes he kind of like it almost looks like he's in pain mm -hmm. you know like he he puts his his hand he puts his face in his hands and he groans and he's like like i think he's questioning his like you know sanity for a moment he's like Oh my God, she just disappeared right in front of me. I think he handles it really well. He handles it really well when he meets Nadelle and he thinks, oh, you know, <laughs> wait, you're married. You could have just told me. I love that moment. But he handles it so diplomatically. And I was he didn't like, say anything in front of Gideon, but yeah. then later he confronts her. And you could tell he's got that, that attitude. Huh? Of, I don't play that game, lady. And, and she's like, you what know, are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> Crazy. Worried? I've never met you. Yeah. It was <laughs> so this moment. And uh, Owen even introduced her and he uh, he talks up the cooking and then he proceeds to let everybody know that they were all his recipes in the first place. So even though she made this beautiful spread for everybody, oh, yeah. it was really still his in the end because he's the one who came up with all the recipes and everything. I'm just like, oh, my God. Could you bragging imagine? rights again. Bragging, bragging. But yeah, and at the very end, and he says, let there be light, um, that little biblical reference, I just thought, oh, God, there's there's people like that, you know, there's people like that in the world, and it just, they did a great job at trying to balance that and not make you completely hate him, at the same time, you de definitely had that sort of, you know, annoyed, constantly, like, oh, here we go again, <laughs> I love even O'Brien's face when he's talking. <laughs> Yeah, but I think they also touched on it then with the fact that he's been married multiple times and that people that's his narcissism is part of his charm yeah. because he doesn't do it to hurt anyone else and it, as you said before it's the betterment of, you know, the universe so to say. But then after a while that narcissism starts to lose its charm mm -hmm. and then starts to become exhausting because you need a lot of energy for a personality a personality like his so yeah, yeah. true it's, it, it's it's um yeah i didn't dislike him at all but i understood um where he was coming from and i was impressed with the fact that he was a bit aware of of um what was going on and his effect on people and how it can be exhausting. He knows he gets a pass. He knows that he gets that pass because he is changing lives. He's, you know, making like his, his contribution outweighs his narcissism. Yeah. He knows it. So he, I think he, he doles it out nice in, in small increments, but it's, definitely there like mm -hmm. you said it gets it even like i think o'brien says later when they're like i dax and o'brien are sitting in the room and he's like you can't push this past 9.5 and then uh say a tick walks in he says hey some people got places to go and o'brien <laughs> says good luck with that you know he's, he kind of like makes that point like this is getting a little like like you said exhausting like good luck you got to deal with him now <laughs> so great with Dax is you know like I've been having dealing with him all day long you know? <laughs> <laughs> <That's great>. yeah <laughs> there's, there's lots of little little nuggets even though this is a very Cisco centric episode it, there are lots of mo good great moments for everybody else too even even uh Cisco has joked to Oprah at the beginning about you know you know you would just hate it to have to be on a working station you know you you just hate it if everything worked properly and he's like I'd love to give it a shot or it would be nice to <laughs> yeah there's it's a lot of enterprise but. Yeah, there's a lot of great nuggets of um, relationship building, and and because relationship is such a big part of the show overall, and I think that's wonderful. Yeah, Just that's nice. the nuggets. Well, it looks yeah, like we're gonna go. Uh, we're gonna go for break. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. I think we're just a little uh, we're in more in um in DS Nine versus Enterprise. Oh yeah. yeah. So Definitely. we have to take a short break. So we will be back to discuss more about DS9, Season 2, Episode 9, Second Sight. Hello, we're back with the second half of this week's episode. 
So there was something that I wanted to discuss in honor of our first ladies only episode of the seventh rule. <laughs> oh, ladies. It involves <laughs> the, the Bechdel test, which yeah. is for the those who aren't aware. It has two women who have names that talk to each other in a scene and they're not talking about men or relationships to a man. Right. I, I think like you could say if it was like a it, a big event that men are involved in that still would count, but they can't be specifically talking about one man. Right. Or right. their relation to the how their world revolves around this man. Right. Right. Yep. It's uh it started in nineteen eighty five with the famous comic strip. Um I'm it's the name it's of a, a comic strip. It's a lesbian comic it strip. It's a lesbian he strip. Says, nice I will watch out for. That and the idea sort of came through as the friend of um, Alison Bechdel, who's the, the, the test is named for her, and her friend Liz and the writings of Virginia Woolf, where Virginia Woolf used to talk at length about uh, gender portrayal in fiction, especially of women. And, uh, and at her own time, like in 1929, when she wrote A Room of One's Own, Virginia made a lot of observations about literature. Um, and then, then the Bechdel test sort of sort of picks up that same concept and then highlights it in more recent fiction. So really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, they say about half of all of the films that have been kind of studied under this test have met the criteria. So pass or failed it. So it's kind of 50, 50 and it's not considered to be like this end all be all, you know, indi indication of how well women are represented in any specific work, right. but it is indicated for like the presence of women in the, in the entire film. Of, like I read that. Films and TV shows that pass the Bechdel test actually do better financially yes. than films that don't. True. Huh. It's true. Um, uh, Think and Killing Eve and um, the success of a lot of uh, female-centered um, dramas and films that are, or even, you know, even if you look at Voyager, there was very little it talk of men. Definitely pass it. I mean, it was a great show for that just for that alone, but it was, um, it was, it's really amazing how you look at every episode. I'm thinking they're very rarely ever talking about men because they're a little busy, um, you know, fighting off some alien or, you know what I mean? Or some weird thing taking over the ship. So, um, they didn't really have time. And they have some of the strongest female characters in all of Star Trek between seven of nine, Bolana and Janeway. They are the, the strongest willed, personality wise in all of the series in my opinion agreed my opinion it's deep space nine who takes that cake but you know oh yeah you can't you're not wrong either i think no. there's room for yeah. both kira <laughs> there's room for kira. both yeah oh for sure yeah i mean it was my my spirit animal for growing up in the 90s so <laughs> yeah well i mean the, just the watching her and um yeah couple or, or uh, reconcile those feelings of anger and resentment and even when she's in the episode she's yeah. talking about how she's trying to keep her cool and trying not to blow up at these ministers but she does talk a lot about men in the sense that she's working with the provisional government or trying to work with the provisional government so there and there are men involved so a lot of those conversations do center on on that but when it's outside of that when she's not dealing with those those bureaucrats um she's still there's still very little talk about like men, especially in a romantic sense. There's definitely. very little that throughout the show. So I think you're definitely right that DS9 overall passes the best. I would agree. Overall. Yes. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> not exactly in second sight, but um, right. because it was right. about a man falling in love. It happened to be all centered right. on his, there was <laughs> his one character scene. development. <laughs> there was one scene that bothered me in relation to the Bastille test specifically, because I was watching the episode with that in mind, because I wanted to know if this episode passed. And I determined that it did not. But there was this scene where Fena and confronts her, you know, Nadal, and Dax is scanning Nadal and Fena, and Dax walks in and uh, Cisco introduces Dax. He says, this is Dax, you know, but when she is scanning both Fena and Nadal, she does not talk directly to mm -hmm. Fena or Nad uh, Fena because Nadal's passed out. She like, N Fena is saying, what's going on? And, and Dax 
blatantly ignores her. Hmm. She talks only to Cisco, and they're in a scene together where, I mean, Dax was probably in Starfleet mode, but she could have said these readings, like, she could have responded to Fena, but they wrote it out, like, it was like, you know, it was like Dax didn't hear her. She was only talking to Cisco, and I thought this could have been an opportunity to, for them to interact. They didn't do it. And, and that, you know, when I was watching it, thinking about the Bestial test, I'm like, this, this scene is wrong for that reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my only thought of that would be that Dax was in science mode and she was more interested in the fact that she was just pure energy rather than a physical entity standing in front of her. Um, and so, so maybe that was where the disconnect came in, but I can definitely understand. Yeah. Now that you mention it, that I, it didn't strike me when I saw it, but yeah. I mean, you can see Fena is, is definitely anxious when Dax yeah, walks in sure. and scans her with the tricorder sure. to begin with, because she's scared. She thinks she's that she's going her or something, you know? And, right. And Dax doesn't do much to sort of allay that anxiety. Right. Like, just does it, you know, scan, scan. She's just your energy, sucks to be you, moving along, you know? And Yeah, her bedside like, manner kind of goes out the yeah. window. <laughs> fell by the wayside, which is a yeah. little bit for me, as you watch Dax's character develop, of the, and I love Dax, you know, the women at DS9 are really my favorite characters in the show, and, and I love the way that Dax grows too, but in this moment you kind of see that distance, and um, it definitely plays on screen, and you feel it. And so I do, I did pick up on that as well. But yeah, it's an interesting. The Bechdel test is really interesting if you. And unfortunately, once you find out about it, it'll you'll think about it almost and apply it to everything that you watch going forward. And it's a really interesting uh, concept and idea. I actually was kind of thinking about all of the Star Treks and mm-hmm. whether or not they passed. And I was having a discussion with my Star Trek fan father that. Uh, the original series, we we don't believe passes because, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, Yahira doesn't really ever talk to any other women. And, like, the doctor, the nurses, they're kind of just eye candy for the most part. Yeah. And then there was a debate on whether or not the next generation passes because I'm not sure it does. I think it does sometimes, but not all the time. Definitely not all the time. There's a there are a lot of episodes, and I'm just like, whoa, really? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's definitely a Troy, but I mean, maybe they had a con- I honestly, I mean, I, I had, it's been forever, but I cannot recall a scene where Beverly and Troy really talked to each other. No, but I think the the person who would probably win that test is Guinan. Yeah. And oh, yeah, that's that, true. She was my favorite on that show, but you know. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Yeah. I I totally forgot about Guinan for a moment. She she often talks about everything, so that probably Guinan probably right there is what allows Next Generation to pass the Best Del test. Yeah, I think what you talk about, um, Beverly and Troy. I mean, there are there. I th- I remember moments where they they chat, but they do talk about romance. They do. Mm-hmm. Those are discuss- They sort of have that. You know, we're just kind of the, the shop talk about men. That those conversations do happen, and those conversations then it, it fails. But and you talk about the original series. Um, de- definitely doesn't pass. But I think yeah, they have to be named. First of all, both both women yeah. in the scene have to be named. So if if you have a, a nurse or some, you know red-shirted character or for lack of a better you know, <laughs> some just random person who doesn't have a name you know it's um then it doesn't count so it would fail automatically but I think yeah. in this case we have when you talk about TNG for the most part the women talk about the men because it the, the ship is the leadership is is men so there's going to it's male-centric you're going to talk about Captain Picard you're going to talk about you know Will Riker and they do talk about Will on the show, they talk about oh, war, and relationships <laughs> with uh, Warp and Riker, and that they go back and forth between. She goes back and forth between the two, so a few times over the course of Next Generation. But for the most part, then you see like uh, 
you know, Deanna doing her job in the course of being a counselor and talking to people about all of their problems, not just, you know, romantic, uh, romantic issues. So I think you're right. It's sort of like, I would give it like an 80, 20, or maybe a 60, 40 and say sort of more or less passes overall. If you look at the entire seven seasons and you'd have to really go back and watch every episode and note and, you know, and go, you know, or tally for everyone you think passes. And then you could really say overall, but um, my general feeling is that Next Generation generally does pass, but like you say, there's lots of episodes that they talk about relationships with men, and so that's, that's just and part when, of it. Uh, Deanna Troy's mother come on board. It is men oh talking. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Always <laughs> All day. Yeah, little yeah. one, then. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be happy with little one, then. My husband, you know, like, <laughs> like uh, yeah. oh, oh, gosh, what's her name? Deanna's oh. mother. Uh, Luaxana? Like, Luaxana. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Holder she, of the sacred chalice of Reese. Yeah. <laughs> she is like 100% about her relationship to men. Like, like you know, serial dater, serial marrier. Like, yes. she just is constantly, like, she has this uh, uh, title for... Um, Oh gosh, what's the planet? Beta Z, yeah. Yeah. And I look terrible right now. But, you know, she has this elaborate, extensive title, but she really does live her life based on who she's married to. Mm-hmm. Well, and then, but that, that changes when she's with her daughter. So the, her relationship with her daughter would pass that test especially when they are in that episode when they're exploring the loss the death of her first oldest daughter or something like that i don't remember it completely oh i but can't remember it's been so long since yeah. i watched next generation but yeah i've been rewatching, but i haven't come across it yet i'm not sure what it's called but she has moments where she could pass that test with yeah, there are moments. I mean, talking to her daughter. Yeah, <laughs> and and if you look at DS Mine, there's lots of there's lots of fa- room for failure in terms of the test because you look at the at the promenade and you look at quarks and you look at all the women and the, there's clear objectification of women in those scenes. But it sort of it serves the story. It serves right. the story, and that there's a reason for it. It's not just you know we want it to be a male centric and we want women to be objectified. We're trying to send that message. It's just that right. we're, we're representing a diverse li- lives and alien cultures and the way people treat and interact with those genders or even having non-gendered or binary, you know, or all those mm-hmm. different even looks at gender and what even that is across Star Trek. We've, we've seen a lot of examples of that. So it's really interesting. I think there's definitely um, lots of scenes where the DS9 does fail, but it, I, I can only think of when it's usually centered around Quark and Dabo and all of <laughs> you know, life or maybe, you know, or even the, the hollow suites and all of that. But that has to be part of the story. That people's life. Of course. Yeah. And relationships, relationship in general is a part of life and it would, it wouldn't be honest if it wasn't explored. So, um, but I think it's not honest to explore it at nauseum. Right. Yeah. So I think Deep Space Nine does a great job of exploring relationships and talking about them without saying, you know, without saying that the relationship is the most important thing in the world. Yeah. Because there's nothing else going on. We, we're going to talk about our feelings rather than deal with the Dominion of War, you know. So it's about it being a woman. Um, I mean, it might be a little different when you're in a same-sex relationship, but, you know, I failed the Bechdel test yesterday in real life. I met a friend. We hadn't seen each other in a while. We went to high school together. We were kind of like, you know, doing a quick catch-up, and it, it men were talked about. And, you know, I was discussing my personal life with her, which I won't go into detail here, but, you know, it was about men. And and then later I got to thinking, I failed the Bechdel test in real life. You know, I, I had an opportunity to talk to a friend and I talked about my relationship status 
Right. It's like one of the first things you might discuss with anybody you meet, like, oh, or some, an old friend you haven't seen in the ages and you go, oh, so are you seeing anyone? Like, it's one of the first things we always do is check in on their relationship status and see how they're doing and are they single or are they with someone? It's ASL, whatever, you know, those, those old, good old days. Um, first thing when you get married. Like, when are you getting married? Things like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so we do. We tend to, as socially as women, we do. That's one of the first things we generally do. I fail it all the time because that's one of the first things I always ask. And, um, but I think it's okay to fail sometimes. Okay to, you know, it's, I think what Allison was trying to life. do was just make us shine, highlight, and wonder about this. Yeah. Like, being a let, I'm gay. Being being gay and coming at it from that, she's just basically saying, let's be careful about uh, sure. not falling into the trap of that this is the only thing that's worth discussing. I'm gay. In my relationship, we talk about men a lot. We talk about our fathers. We talk about our brothers. We talk about we talk about our relationships with every everybody in our lives. But I talk. We, we tend to talk more about our mothers because. <laughs> <laughs> well, then there's also reasons. there's also a situation um, specifically. I'm going to bring up Melissa in this is that when you're married to a man who is very famous or has a big fan base, sometimes you can get pigeonholed in, oh, that's, that's Aaron's wife. That's Aaron's widow. And, you know, like you don't always explore people, the woman behind the man as her own identity. And like, Mm. you see that a lot of times in movie stars when they get divorced, like, they're like, look, this isn't about me and so and so. I'm my own person. I have my own life. And you know, sometimes we forget to think about separating the person from who they were with. That's true. Sure. It, go, it does go both ways. It does, I mean, mm-hmm. it happened with Marina, her husband, and we didn't even. I I feel like that sort of got left out. Like he sort of got left out yeah. because it wasn't a Trek actor. It was the Trek actor's spouse. And so he was a, a well-respected musician and guitarist in his own right. And no yeah. one been talking about that. So I would gladly fail the best shell test to tell the world about how talented Michael Lamper was and how sad we are that he's no longer with us to produce great music because he was great. But that, that's me. You know, I'm, I'm saying that's necessary. We, we need to remember that, you know, it doesn't really matter. I think, like I say, Allison was just trying to make a point. And she did. She right. Made a point. Um, but it's something that we have to measure all of film and TV and music <laughs> and condemn everything that, you know, whether right. it's, it's just part of the human experience and, right. and art imitates life. So we have to be true to that in, in many yeah. ways. And I am proud to say that the seventh rule passes the Bechdel test. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we talk about men in the show, yeah. but we talk about it as a whole. We talk about different topics. We talk about our feelings, you know, and then we talk about like the intricacies about the science behind things. So I'm, that was one thing that I was like, you know what? The seventh rule passes. (laughs) Agreed. And we do, we talk, we've talked, even today, we've talked so much about the women in the show and those moments that they have with each other. We've really analyzed a, a lot of those intricacies, as you said, between Dax and Nadell, or Na- Dax and Fennet, uh, um, Kira, Kira and, and her relationships with everybody uh, on the station and how they all interact and develop over time. So yeah, it's definitely true. We, we, we talk about everything, you know, it's, it's well-rounded. We're very well-rounded. Yes. And with this episode alone, it, it passes. <laughs> Agreed. Even though that was a, we even said it was a Cisco-centric episode, but we still managed to make yeah. it more about the women in this in the episode <laughs> yeah <laughs> for the most part you know um, so that was all good. women yeah. all the time <laughs> right but, yeah. <clears throat> but we still miss we miss our men don't we we miss ryan and Sirac. Yeah. of course of course but we need that balance you know yes balance is the key word balance in everything and I did have one more fun fact about the episode mm-hmm. that the storyline of Say a Tech, um, they used it to tie in the, um, the Star Trek movies and the next generation because the technology that he references uh, directly references Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Yeah, terraforming. Yeah, mm-hmm. the terraforming technology, and I'm, and then I believe in I, 
in the book, the companion guide, they talked about how, um, you know, this takes place in the more future. So say attack, you know, theoretically has built upon what Genesis failed in the Star Trek movies. He built upon that technology. He improved it. And they said that that was a neat way that they tied in DS9 to some of the older shows. Yeah, I, I picked up on that like right away, you know, when they were first talking about Blue Horizon. I was like, I would love to, I would love to go to Blue Horizon. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, say a text like, it's amazing and I built it. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally. Um, but it was, it, I would love to have um, maybe explored it a little bit further. They do explain, and you know, as best as you could, you know, without as much track mail babble, and he does explain sort of what they're going to do with the star and how they're going to bring it back to life. And it's they do that in a really nice, layman, sort of, you know, accessible way. So I was like, okay, I sort of basically understand what you're basically going to try to do. Um, but I would like to explore a little bit more about terraforming and see, see more of it happen. But, you know, it was great. They did. It, it wasn't the point of the episode. So, right. you know, but I was intrigued by it. It was nice to see. Yeah, that would be an interesting episode to explore, to to see a success, success ugh, can't speak successful creation of a new planet. Yeah, yeah, that would be they really talk great. about it. Or yeah, Blue Horizon was mentioned that that was terraformed a hundred percent with um, right. the attacks technology, um, but they don't really besides the sun reigniting the sun they don't really i i guess reigniting the sun was supposed to help bajor um regrow or or make some of the land more hab 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 habitable because yeah. um i think in previous episodes they said like half the land wasn't farmable right because of the war and but they never really then kind of said what i don't know if they even ever brought it up again but they don't really talk about if it was successful in helping Bajor be revived at all yeah okay. I was curious to see if they like had they standardized the use of terraforming technology at this at this point because it seems like they were they were doing that it was sort of like he's just oh, terraforming over here terraforming over there new plants here <laughs> you know what I mean like it became like the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy sort of thing you know, <laughs> right <they're> like, you <laughs> been know. there done that <laughs> So I, I was trying to figure that out, but yeah, it was um, it was good. Uh, any any final thoughts? Or? Well, we did not talk about the ending yet. That was one yeah. thing that we said we were going to circle back to. That's right. Is how Sayatek ultimately redeemed himself in the eyes of both Nadal and you know his his narcissism of I'm going to go out with a bang. Um, Literally, you know. Sayatek realized that Nadal's unhappiness was killing her. So he sacrificed himself uh, to, I guess he just was in the ship as it uh, reignited the star. He drove into the star. I can't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. But ended up sacrificing himself while reigniting the star in order to free Nadal to be able to go back home. To he essentially sacrificed himself to save her. And because she, because she would have died. I mean, this, this happened once before and it's happening now, but it, who's to say it wouldn't have happened in the future. And I think he was also a little afraid himself that he didn't know where to go after this. Yeah. You know, where do you go from here? So, I think he loved her enough to let her go and let himself go, you know, so. Um, and, and let himself go in a way that was unforgettable. Exactly, because that's the way he lived. <laughs> I just love that he says, let there be light. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow, that Bible, like, that was crazy that he threw that in there. I was like, how would he even, would they even have had, I just thought that was a, a good little bit. And it made me think about, you know, again, like Christianity and like, that was a Bible reference, legit. So I was just like, hmm, interesting that he would say that, like in the 24th century, this guy is making Bible references. At the end and of if you look at his, yeah, but historically, in terms of the Star Trek universe, when people look back on Sayatek as a, you know, a scientist, they're not really going to say, 
oh, he sacrificed himself for his wife. They're going right. to say there was some accident or that he, he, he was determined. So he's, you know, and that, that quote, let there be light is probably going to be in the history books as his final words. And, you know, like, like this going out, like it's like it's God, gonna, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. going to be recorded that way in the history sure. books, giving Sayatek his, his one last hit of narcissism for everyone. Sure. But I also think it was more for Nadell's sake than anything. Yeah, else. He's I mean, a crack, you know, he, he, yeah. there's a moment where he breaks away where you say, as you say, he becomes ex- almost exhausted by his own. Uh, right. Yeah. You know, by ways. And yeah, he even, he even, there's a moment he even says, I don't even know, like, I don't want to know why God knows why she even loves me or, you know, after right. all that bragging about her being enamored by him, he's still, it, it was it was sort of a facade, as most are, um, most narcissists, most ego maniacal people. It takes a lot of effort to prop yourself up constantly. So you actually did see that humanity, that that flaw, uh, you know, realization of his that he just kind of goes, yeah, she's worth more. I've done everything there is to do. What more do I have to do and accomplish? As you said, Melissa, and this is it. So might might as well go out with a bang and do and do a good right. thing. Good, yeah. do a good thing. So yeah, it's good. It's a good one. There's more to unpack than I even realized. Cause I, I watched it twice, and there were things that I kept picking up on the second time around. Like as you, as mostly happens, it happens very common. But um, it was, it's a good episode. It's fun. Yeah. There's a lot of things that you could like small lines that you can really focus on and and break down and realize that the DS9 writers they oh, they are brilliant. amazing with how they fit in so much intricacy to every scene and and they do a great job with having each scene have a purpose which right is and then so watchable yeah and push it along without so much exposition you know it, it's real it's real life it feels honest and and it's not talking at you it brings you in to the situation that is being portrayed on the screen so I love, yeah, I think the DS9 writers are brilliant in that. That's a good one. Yeah. So, so props to the writers of that episode. <laughs> and and all the actors. Written by Mark Jared O'Connell, Ira Bear, and Robert Wolf. Okay. Those are the writers of that particular episode. So, um, The actor's name who played uh, Sayatik, do you offhand do you remember? I just forgot. It's Richard uh, Kiley. Or Keely? He's so great. I, I, is he still around? I mean, what, you know, it's just, oh. it's just <laughs> shout out to him. He did a great job. He did a great job on that episode. I know his, he was up there in age when he did did the, the roles, and it's been, you know, 20 something years now. So I'm not sure if he's even around, but it'd be nice to know. So, closing out this particular episode of The Seventh Role, we want to thank all our wonderful fans for joining us in our first ladies only episode. <laughs> Ooh, and okay, not our last. You'll see <laughs> us bring it back in some men for the the free for all yes. after episode. So stay tuned for that. Don't miss it. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> Welcome back to the free for all segment of this episode of the Seventh Rule. And unfortunately, we had to bring some men back. So we have. Uh, <laughs> we're failing the bestial test today. <laughs> and then Palmer speaking in. I do have Troy and Crusher. He's and crushing Crusher it today. He's on my shirt. Wow, that's so cool. Palmer so are all about the men. But look at the background. I've but got Homer pinned up got, right now. Check out that background. He's that's got a, Nog, so you know that's the best background <laughs> ever, ever. And, and Jake Cisco looks opinion. like he's underage drinking in there. He looks Cisco. like he's so. Has an Irish rock to Gino. Ciroc yeah. looks like he's puking back into his mug. Ew. Oh, oh. <laughs> Ryan. He looks like he's like, oh, I've had too many. No. Oh, man. It looks like they're in Quark's bar, but I can't be certain. It's an interesting it's angle. Quark's bar. Yeah. yeah. And I remember that episode because Nog is trying to um, wait for the Klingons to reach a certain decibel point decibel yes decibel mark level, right? level that's the word um before he goes to confront them 
because he's yeah, so right. Up. That was such it, a good moment. Yeah. Is that the one where he's confronting Martok? Yes, but then he falls Whoa. out of his chair instead. So <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, <laughs> you look too far back, Noggy boy. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> Just leave me here. <laughs> so Homer's got one other thing to show us, right? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. So um, on the last free-for-all, I, I, I made a note because I wanted to remember to uh, to to show this up because Immo was just amazing with everything that he had. So I have uh, from Star Trek Mission mm -hmm. New York uh, three years ago, a bucket that Renee drew and uh, the proceeds went to Doctors Without Borders. So this is, of course, one of my favorite things. Mm. Yeah, he was great. He was, he was wonderful. That's definitely a bucket list item. That's oh, oh boy! No, 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 had no. My dad already made the Odo <laughs> bucket joke the other day. I was like, "It's too oh soon. no, it's too soon. You're not allowed." Soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too soon. Yeah. 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 Somebody, I was in one of our groups or Facebook or something. I just remember somebody said that 2019 needs to hurry up and be over so that we can stop losing mm. some of our favorite people this year. <laughs> Make it yeah. next year. It, it's definitely been a hard year for Star Trek. You know, we've, we've lost, um, there's been a lot of big stars that have passed away in 2019. Yeah. Yeah, um, and there really isn't a day that goes by that we don't think about Aaron. I know we don't have to tell you that, Melissa, because it's every second for you, obviously. Yeah. Um, but it's constant. And when Sorok and I are recording our show, all all we do is, you know, Aaron just keeps coming up and coming up. And every time I'm watching an episode, I think, oh, Aaron would love this, or Aaron would have. Aaron, oh boy, Aaron would have razzed me for that. Or Aaron, you know, especially those, like where I just hear him saying, Yeah, you know, gotcha, or or wow, or, or yeah. I feel like they could have done more with this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when I missed the free for all for two weeks ago, I watched the episode afterwards. There was something that Ryan said. And in my uh -oh. head, I was like, Oh, uh -oh. that's a that's a wow moment for wow. Aaron. Like, wow. You know, Really, I can't, Brian? I can't wow. what it is, but Ryan said, wow. I was like. <laughs> Melissa, did you get a lot of wow moments? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, sometimes hourly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 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 <laughs> wow. Wowerly, yes. Wowerly. <laughs> <laughs> that's better than Ryan's. So that's good. Yeah. Zing, baby. That that that's a, that's a great hashtag. Wowerly, wowerly. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Homer, you you missed that we were talking about the the Bechdel test in relationship to yes. And and then you know that we went into great in depth talk about you know the relationship of women and Ryan said something off screen that I don't know if you want to repeat Ryan about how how sad it was that we have to think about that well yeah uh well first of all when you guys were saying that uh Crusher and Troy don't talk much my th first thought was are you kidding the best next generation scene ever Kat knows where I'm going with this the stretching scene, <laughs> the most. Oh, what? Well, they're doing doing all, all, right? You know, it's like the Jane Fonda video. They're getting ready to work oh, out. Together. They were like buddies, you know. They were like, yes. Uh, future green screen. Oh, but they were talking about a boy. They were talking yeah. about. Them. Yes. So it fails. Yes, yeah. I'm just saying no. that they did talk. You were saying that they didn't talk at all. No, it fails. Well, I was. I meant in relationship to men. You are not yep. talking yep. about. No, that was the biggest fail in that scene because that's all they were talking about. <laughs> right. And they were in the worst outfits. Oh and it was, 80s, anyway. 80s yoga workout <laughs> yeah. outfits. I'm not for that same the, outfit. I'm the swear. tights under the leotards, right? Yes. <laughs> like, let's did, highlight <clears throat> all the important parts. And you know, they were just like, we can't even do this scene after lunch because there's no way you could even. Oh, eat. No. <laughs> 12 hours prior to filming yeah they went on a, a liquid diet 
If you had no, a second but, life, Matt, I wouldn't want to be caught in those things. But to what uh, Heather's referencing, uh, yeah, I was saying it's kind of sad that we even have to have that test. Now, you know, there you guys made a lot of great points discussing it and, and all this. And, and mm-hmm. you know, and I think you're right that, like, you know, it, it's not that it's past its prime, but it, it made its point, And now we can move forward from it. But the, but the point of it was that something like that did need to get pointed out. Right. That like, that there's such minor wishes, you know, two women in a scene that shouldn't be too hard. They both have a character name that shouldn't be too hard. And they can talk about anything in the world other than a man. And that sounds like it should be so like easy, but the fact that that was ever even brought up as a test shows how bad it used to be, you know? So I think that was great. I, I, and I think you guys, uh, as Worf says, and you told it well. (laughs) (laughs) To repeat so that Homer knows, I did say that I was proud to say that the seventh rule passes the Bechdel test. I'd be curious to see how I know TNG failed, but uh, I'd be curious to see how DS9 does on the test. Uh, I I know it's going to do so much better because you have characters that are driven. Uh, You have Kira. um, Yeah. Like on everybody else. Yeah, you have Dax, and they're not all about, oh, this guy, he's dreamy. No, I mean, they're not talking about Bashir like that for sure. And then so, later on, we yeah. have Cisco's wife, Sorry. second wife, which yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, she's a captain. Yeah. And yeah. it's all about not talking about Cisco for certain. Like, she's not talking to another woman about Cisco for sure. Well, and then they even bring in um, one episode characters. Like the next one after Second Sight is the sanctuary where oh, the. Yeah. The race comes through the wormhole, and and the women are the leaders, right? Of that race, yeah. So they're like, she says, it's weird for the men to even be here. They, right? Why are they here? Go away. That's and, how Homer and I feel right now. Yeah, we could we could come back. We could come back later, <laughs> or not, or or not. I'll just step over here. No, I should change my background. I'm sure. That makes me th- no way. That's the best ever. Uh, that makes me think of a good free for all question. Okay, here oh, it is, man. If you are in the world of Star Trek and you are sent on a, an away mission, whatever it may be, you don't know any of the details, and you got to pick three characters to accompany you all women from any series oh man i know we're gonna start with you heather yeah good choice <laughs> i know last week or two weeks ago you said in, in heather's not here to pick on so let's go I with homer you must have misunderstood <laughs> you can't tell, but he opted for the oh, other red. The open now. There's no running away. There's no hiding it. <laughs> okay, so or other other. Man, okay, this is hard. You wouldn't just have three other people. Come I on. would say I would pick Bolana for mm. her engineering expertise. Hmm. Kira for her. You know, she's the muscle. Yeah. And I would kind of like I I it's hard to pick between seven of nine and Dax because Dax has so much and and Dax is that like, Jazia or is experience. it experience? And but the seven of nine is just she she's so familiar with other races. So mm. I mean that it's tough to pick between the two. You're right. I might, I might have to go with Dax just because of her great experience. She has such a range of abilities be- between all of her lives. Hmm. Mm. What about you, Miss Cat R. King? Oh, uh, it would depend on the mission. What's the mission? I mean, that you don't know. You don't know. know. All right. All right. Um, I would definitely want Janeway. I mean, she's the captain, but she goes on the missions anyway. So I'd say, yep, yeah, I'd take her with me because 
she's good at coming she's a really quick thing uh quick like problem solving person she can quick think on her feet and resolve problems very quickly and she has that scientific knowledge but the command and leadership experience definitely does help in knowing you you feel confident i feel like we're going to get out of it so i definitely have janeway um and i would i would, it would, I would love to have dax it would be cool to actually have them on the same thing mm. and uh yeah, think Bologna or seven of nine would be an excellent boon to the entire team just dax dax having eight or nine lifetimes of experience and knowledge um that's really beneficial but also seven of nine just having that uh, intellect um, is really helpful too. So it would be tough, but I think the Borg in this case, Janeway. Um, say again? The Borg Collective. Yeah. Collective knowledge of the Borg. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it definitely does su surpass DAX. So if you really did, we're going into something flying completely blind, it would it would probably behoove you to have uh, Seven of Nine instead. So I'd definitely say Janeway and I would say uh, Seven of Nine and, and maybe DAX, just those three would be great. What about and you? And also good muscle. What about you, Melissa? So definitely Kira. Because <laughs> right, we knew that was coming. <laughs> she is, she's a leader in and of her, itself. Um, and she's intelligent. She knows how to work in any um, circumstances. And she um, is willing to learn and listen to people, uh, even if they are not necessarily people she likes. Um, Dax, definitely, because she's so intelligent. One, Jadzia Dax has a huge scientific background and she's brilliant in her own right, but then she's also got, you know, how many, seven lifetimes of experience before her. Like hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, um, and I mentioned this woman in the episode, Guinan. Oh, yeah. She yeah. Brings, brings some wisdom and a, probably a different perspective to any mission so those would be my three she would be the problem solver the person who says let's take a moment to think about this mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mark twain agrees with that assessment what about you homer <laughs> uh wow this is this is a tough one uh there there are so many kick-ass women that you could bring on an away mission in star trek um i will say kira um She's a little rough around the edges, but she has her heart in, in, in the right place and is able to do what needs to be done. I, and my tough decision is related to like, there, there are four or five or six that I would like to bring along. And there are only so many spots in a transporter pod uh, <laughs> pad. So um, my, my second one would be to Paul. Um, oh, yeah. I, I think, yeah. I think that um, she she was ready to take command and was sort of bristling at being under Archer and uh, certainly would be fine in, in any away mission. And then the third one, this is the toughest. It's like, is it Janeway? Is it Torres? Is it seven of nine for me? So I have to think about what's the rest of the team made up of. We have to fall um, and we have Kira, so a couple of women of action. So I want someone, I mean, Paul's going to be thinking about things and they're both going to be thinking about things. So I'm thinking Balana. So I get that engineering aspect as well. And then you also get sort of like that Klingon, half Klingon passion in there. So those are my three. Mm. I'm glad you brought up to Paul because mm. there's in, in that enterprise, she makes a point at one point where they're trying to influence her. And she's like, look, you hired me to be Ooh, a Vulcan yeah. representative. I know, and you got to stop micromanaging me. <laughs> you got to let me make the decisions here. Mm -hmm. Whoa, yeah. that's that attitude. Well that is, that's a, that's a strong, strong character. Good choice. Oh, wait, that was my choice. Good choice. Yeah, I, love <laughs> choice. I love the idea of having Kira there, but because she's sort of got a, a hot head and a short fuse. Yeah. It would, I would be concerned that she would let that anger or that uh, whatever it is, you know, that kind of get the best of her in a situation where she needs to stay calm and collect. Although you do see her calm down and and grow over the course of DS9. So it depends on which, which Kira. Are we talking about Kira at the beginning or Kira sort of toward the end? You know, we could split hairs all day the long. Kira. <laughs> oh. Mirror Kira. 
Mary. Oh, Mary. No, I, <laughs> I almost went yeah. to Paul too. To Paul was definitely a, a top person for me, um, but I didn't. I went with somebody that I think every single person here did. Dax, Jadzia Dax, more specifically. Um, Jim, that's second, choice, second is our buddy Hoshi. Um, you never know. I mean, that's she's I think she and Travis were the two most underutilized characters, maybe in all of Star Trek, definitely in Enterprise. So let's give her a chance to, you know, she when she was introduced, she had all this potential. They never used her. She I still, was the oh. Universal Translator before that's right. the exactly. Universal Translator. She's brilliant. And the and third person and 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 West. And the third person is Lieutenant Nan of Discovery. I was vacillating wow. between her and Tasha Yar. They were kind of, you know, back and forth with them. But I'm going to go with, I'm gonna go with Nan. So those are my guys. Girl, ride them into battle. Yeah, you guys, us, your women. Guys, you <laughs> you guys. Good choices. Good Thank you, y'all, y'all. So um, I think we all learned something today. Um, I think the children have something to look up to, and we've done a lot of good. Children have to look up to taller people. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and the seventh rule embraces the ladies. And short people. Uh, I and don't children. know if you meant that the, the way it sounded. <laughs> <laughs> <I> mean, Encourages. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, the ladies definitely support and encourage and uh, uh, empower us. So we definitely try to do the same. Ryan, maybe you them. and I should just step aside and let the ladies finish this one. All right. I'll stop recording. <laughs> no, no, no. They should, you can do that part. Just push a button. How do you I'm going to go like uh, this. Yeah, cool. <laughs> All right. Feel free to close us out. Uh, and we will. Let me. Let me get my so, face out thank of here. you for watching the free for all. And we want to say thanks to Kat R. King, Melissa Longo, myself, Heather Jordan, our wonderful Brian T. Hutz, the, the amazing Homer, uh. <laughs> Homer Frizzell, and of course, hand, Homer Frizzell. Our, yeah. our missing stars. We want to thank Sirach. Lofton and always in our hearts, Aaron Eisenberg. Yes. So thank well you said. for watching the seventh rule and keep your ears open. And Rex Wood and Emma Radka. <laughs> oh, that's right. And our producers, um, Rex Wood, Emma Radka, and Odyssey Radio, Russ Hasledge. And Les Coke. Dennis. And so many other wonderful people. Apparently. Ryan does it better. I'm sorry. He does. <laughs> Don't say that. We're so Denise happy. Koch. <laughs> Dennis. Dennis Koch. <laughs> and, and just for the record, I am wearing my Commander Pips today. Nice. Mm -hmm. Commander Homer. Under exactly. Rizal. Thank you oh, for watching whoops. the seventh rule. Cool. <laughs> we did it, you guys. Yay. 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 Good work, everybody.